<clears throat> okay, we'll go ahead and get started. I want to welcome everyone to the 2020 National Coalition of Promise Zones Food and Agricultural uh, Workshop this morning with Alan Shannon from USDA. We really quickly want to go over some uh, housekeeping rules. Uh, the main one that we should be of concern is that we want everybody to stay on mute. All questions that you may have during this presentation, please use your chat format below. Please type all your questions in the chat. We do have a moderator, Ms. Andrew Ikior, will be uh, watching those and be uh, reading those questions, and then she will directly connect with Mr. Shannon to make sure those questions are answered. We would ask, though, when you submit a question, if you would supply a email address, just in case we are un unable to answer the question, we will get that question answered and emailed to you as soon as possible. So again, please keep all your computers on mute and uh, ask all your questions through the chat format. At that particular point in time, there will be opportunities for questions. Andrea will uh, address those to Mr. Shannon, and then we'll work together collaboratively to make sure that we answer those accordingly. So at this time, I want to turn the presentation over to our moderator, Mr. Mrs. Andrea Ikior. <laughs> Thank you, Salas. Um, as Salas said, my name is Andrea Ikior, and I am the Promazon liaison um, for Evansville. Um, I work out of the HUD Indiana field office, so I'm absolutely grateful to have this opportunity just to connect with the National Coalition of Promise Zones, because um, this is a platform that we've been doing at Evansville, so this is awesome that it's, you know, spread across the country. I will point this out. Me and Silas, we don't have a battle, but he's got on his high school, you know, shirt he's representing, and see, he didn't tell me because I would have worn my Alabama, but that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> But I digress. Um, yes, thank you for joining um, this session with USDA. We have before us Alan Shannon. I will say this, Alan is like a walking USDA encyclopedia. He knows everything. So he's amazing. So you guys are in for a treat. Um, and I did wanna open it up um, and let Alan, please just share a few words about yourself. I know last session I wrote, uh, read the bio, that was pretty boring. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself? <laughs> sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, first, with uh, I am going to disregard Silas's instruction to keep my phone muted. So I'm assuming that I can unmute my phone, Silas. <laughs> yes, you're, you're, okay. you're free to be unmuted. Special exception. Okay. Special exception. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Andrea, and thank you, Silas. So I've been involved in Promise Zone in Evansville for I think three or four years now, maybe since its inception. And it's such a great program and I've been honored to have been involved with the team. They are doing lots of great things. And uh, before I introduce myself more, I just wanna say, having gone to Evansville for three or four years now, I can see the difference that the engaged community and the Promise Zone activities have made. From my first trip there to my last one last summer, I saw real differences in this small city on the banks of the Ohio River. So really exciting. So, so who am I? Um, Alan Shannon, and I've worked at USDA for 30 plus years now. I know I'm remarkably well preserved. Uh, I look like I just graduated from high school, I'm sure. Uh, but the truth of the matter is I've been working at USDA these many years and many different roles and primarily with SNAP and for about 12 years now, I've been the public affairs director. So the particular agency that I work in, Food and Nutrition Service, we're responsible for the oversight and administration of the 15 federal nutrition assistance programs. Um, I'll get into that in a few minutes, but um, I've done food writing on the side um, and, and some ag related writing and our programs are engaged and involved in farm to school. And because we're part of USDA, while our programs are focused on getting food to all Americans that need it, there's also that agricultural aspect. So super excited to be here and to be talking about food and agriculture. So, so um, Andrea, do you want me to just get into it? Okay. All right. I'm going to jump into it. So 
I'll start with mentioning uh, it's so exciting that there are so many people across the country that are interested in food and ag uh, because I always say and I travel around the region a lot we have seven states in the Midwest region and I'll come into communities that uh, maybe have some economic challenges and in my view they're really overlooking the opportunities that are right before them and one of these is food and agriculture Everybody eats every day. And when you look at a community and you think about how many dollars are being spent on food, and if those food dollars are not being spent on food that's grown and produced locally, those dollars are leaving that community and that's an untapped resource for economic development. So, Here's a quick agenda. Um, I'll provide an overview, USDA FNS programs and grants, just so you can get an idea of what's available. Uh, and then I'm gonna go over some local food models to give you an idea of some of the models that are out there. And, and these are constantly evolving and there are new ones popping up every day. And then farmer's market models, of course, with COVID, there are some challenges there, but there are lots of robust robust uh, farmer's market models out there. And then we'll do questions. And as uh, Andrea and Silas mentioned, you can ask a question at any time. And I actually prefer that. So um, because sometimes if you ask a question about maybe a model or a program that will, um, make me think of some additional information that might be helpful to provide. So, and at the end, I'll also provide my email address. And even though I'm in the Midwest region and primarily cover the seven states in that region, I'm happy to connect you to my counterparts in the other seven regions around the country, or I might be able to answer the question myself. So, so please keep those questions coming. And to my point about the how foundational food and agriculture are. This is in our Capitol building in Washington, DC. When tillage begins, other arts follow. The farmers, therefore, are the founders of human civilization by Daniel Webster. So that goes to show the importance of agriculture. We've got to eat every day. Somebody's got to produce that food. There's economic opportunity involved with that. In addition to making sure that Everybody has got food. If they don't have food and they're not eating, um, that actually deteriorates our economic and societal foundations because kids don't perform as well as school uh, in school if they don't have a good diet and don't have regular access to food. Um, they're likely going to have more health problems as they get older, and that's going to cost us both in the loss of that child and their contributions as a contributing member of our society and also the healthcare costs. So multiple costs involved with not ensuring that everybody's got access to good healthy food and regular food. So when we talk about local food systems, um, why do we care? There's, as I mentioned, there's direct eco economic benefit to communities, the education and health in schools that I just touched on. Um, with local foods and focusing on food as foundational, we can have increased access to healthy food. And then there are job opportunities as well, beginning farmer opportunities. I'm gonna talk about some of these and lots of states around the country and lots of regions are really identifying with local food and doing a lot of work in this area. And you can see some of the examples here, Tennessee, Ohio, South Dakota, Pennsylvania. So there are lots more out there and a growing number every day. So when we think about the benefits uh, to farmers and growers, and these can be urban farmers as well, the benefits to local producers and economies with local food in the mainstream supply chains, farmers retain only 15 cents of the consumer food dollar. And the rest of that dollar goes out of the community. So that was my point earlier about um, the benefits of locally produced food and a local food system. More of those dollars stay in the community and don't leave it. 
So USDA's Food and Nutrition Service, we're one of 17 USDA agencies and we're focused on ending hunger and improving nutrition in America. And you can see here that we wanna reduce hunger by providing children and low-income people access to food, a healthful diet and nutrition education. And there is that American agricultural support as part of that. The 15 programs that I mentioned earlier, the largest one, I'm sure everybody has heard of SNAP, formerly the Food Stamp Program. And we also do school meals, breakfast and lunch. <laughs> Currently with COVID, we've got um, probably as many models out there as there are states. So a lot of these programs converted to grab and go where families could come in and get those packaged meals. And I have to say that our school uh, partners and education partners in the states really did a phenomenal job of pivoting when the schools closed to make sure that families had access to those meals. TFAP, that's emergency food assistance. That's a food program that works in partnership with food banks. And we provide food and funding to those food banks. And then that food goes to food pantries and soup kitchens and the like. Uh, you may have heard of WIC, which focuses on um, infants, women, infants, and children, and women that are pregnant, um, child and adult care food program, food distribution on Indian reservations, our summer food service program, which also operated a little differently this year when school's out, so kids that get their meals at school, the summer food service program provides those meals during the summertime or other periods when school is out of session. And then we've got some smaller farmers market and some other smaller programs as well. I'm gonna talk about the farmers market programs later. So I'm gonna get into some of the programs and grants, as I mentioned, SNAP. And a lot of times when I talk to communities, uh, they also overlook SNAP. So they don't think about the opportunities there. Uh, if you look at your community and you analyze how many SNAP dollars are coming into the community, and uh, if those SNAP dollars are not being spent on local food, those federal dollars are leaving the community almost as quickly as they're coming into it. And there is an economic benefit. You've got the employees that are delivering the food, stocking the food, selling the food, and the like. But as that slide earlier showed, if more of those dollars are spent on local foods, there's going to be more of those dollars staying in the community. So if you look at your community, especially if it's economically challenged, chances are there are a lot of SNAP dollars coming into the community. And if you can think of ways to encourage SNAP participants, and I'll get into a program later on that can help to do this, to use those dollars on locally produced foods, you're gonna have more of an economic benefit from this huge program, our largest program at USDA. The Gus Schumacher Nutrition Incentive Program. Um, this is a fairly new program. Uh, it was created maybe two farm bills ago and the farm bill is the uh, legislation that uh, authorizes most of our programs. So this program was built off of models that had been occurring across the country, primarily at farmers markets, Wholesome Wave and some other not-for-profits, uh, Fair Food Network in Michigan, had piloted these programs to incentivize the purchase of fresh fruits and vegetables at farmers markets for SNAP participants. So a SNAP participant would go to the farmers market, they would buy $20 of fruits and vegetables and they would get an additional $20, like a voucher to come back or they could even spend it then. The idea behind it is that everybody should have access to these healthy locally grown fruits and vegetables and that the farmers should also benefit. So it's hard to have a local food system where low-income people or people that are out of a job temporarily don't have access to those same foods. So it really benefits everybody. So Congress recognized this and created the Finney program two farm bills ago, the Food Insecurity Nutrition Incentive Program. Uh, we at the federal government love to use acronyms and uh, because we have so many different programs and many of them have very long names, we like to shorten them. So if I refer to something as Finney, you know that that's the 
former nutrition incentive program. And then with the latest Farm Bill program, uh, they named, renamed the program and provided double the funding called it the Gus Schumacher Nutrition Incentive Program, and that's named after Gus Schumacher, who pioneered this concept. So every year we do a grant announcement, and uh, we have three different size grants, and uh, these provide funding along with local funding that's a requirement in order to incentivize uh, fresh fruit and local vegetable purchases by SNAP participants. Uh, our farmer's market nutrition program, uh, this works in conjunction with our WIC program. And this provides coupons to WIC participants to shop at a farmer's market. And I'll say with both of these programs and the one I'm gonna talk about next, our senior farmer's market program, uh, in general, what we've discovered and our farmer's market partners is that once you provide somebody with uh, access to a farmer's market and to these locally grown fruits and vegetables, the habit remains there. So they, most people that go develop uh, a desire to return. And there are some organizations, I'll talk about one later on, that actually did some uh, a study on this and measured this. So you give somebody the incentive to go to the farmer's market, that incentive no longer exists. Maybe they're not on SNAP anymore. Uh, most of them or many of them will return to that farmer's market. So say they get a job again, um, they're gonna continue to go to the farmer's market. So again, this benefits everybody in the community. It benefits those local growers and farmers and food producers. So this farmer's market nutrition program gives these vouchers to WIC participants. And then the Senior Farmers Market Nutrition Program, the smaller program, it doesn't operate everywhere. Um, and I should mention all of our programs are administered by state partners. So our states determine which markets are going to operate this program. And they try to focus on the communities that have the uh, higher numbers of seniors that are low income. But of course, there have to be markets available in the area as well. Um, farm to School, this has been a fairly, well, fairly new program, maybe 10, uh, 10 to 12 years now. And we also offer grants with this, uh, annual grants. And when you think about Farm to School and you think, okay, is this a program that helps farmers and helps schools connect so that the food that schools are serving in the cafeterias are, is procured from local farmers. It's really more than that. It's also education. So there are grants that provide education to students. And we know there's research out there that shows that when students have a connection and know where their food is grown, from, uh, grown who's growing it and how it's grown, uh, they're more likely to eat it and they're, they're more likely to have healthy diets. And again, this is the education piece sort of like the incentive for the farmer's markets. Once people are introduced to it, many times it's an aha moment and they also realize the benefits of it. So farm to school program is, is like that. And, uh, and I would mention too, that when you think about a local food system and the economic opportunities, and you look at institutions, not just schools, but hospitals as well, and other large institutions, colleges and the like, where are they purchasing their food? And if they're purchasing more food locally, there's uh, those are federal dollars in many cases that are being retained in the community. And that really helps with economic development. This is another USDA program. And I'll mention that several of these programs that I'm gonna be talking about, GUSNIP uh, and this one, and several other ones. They're not food and nutrition service programs, uh, but I'm gonna be covering them. I'm not an expert, uh, despite what Andrea kindly uh, said about me. Some of these programs I know a little bit about, and um, I can get you to the right people and get more information on these programs. But uh, because in many cases, there's not a USDA agency that covers these programs out in the regions, they're just in DC or Kansas City. Uh, we in the regions try to talk about these programs as well. So this is a great program to sort of help 
build or uh, start off a community food project. So this is also an annual grant and the purpose is it's a program to fight food insecurity and by, by developing community food projects that help promote the self-sufficiency of low-income communities. So it can help to build the local food system that I'm talking about it is very critical and could be foundational for economic development. The Beginning Farmer and Rancher Development Program. I'm going to talk about this a little bit later with one of the models that I'm going to focus on. Another USDA program, um, because the average age of the American farmer is just under 60, uh, we have to ask the question, who is going to be growing our food in the future? And it's difficult to get into farming. So we have this grant program to help train the next generation of farmers. And these can also be leveraged and used to help a community. It, um, the one that I'm gonna talk about later looks at it more broadly. It, it also um, uh, introduced its youth to the, to the concept of education in agriculture and just the discipline involved with that, even if they don't go into farming. This is an EPA grant. Brownfield grants, and these can be used in areas that uh, had, had been contaminated. And uh, so we've seen some interesting models there, including farmers markets, year round farmers markets. The high tunnel system initiative, this is a smaller program that's administered out of USDA's uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service. That's a hoop house there, which is also called a high tunnel. And if you're farming, uh, particularly in the northern part of the country, or even in higher elevation parts of the country that are further south, your season is going to be shorter and a high tunnel can help extend that season. And there are data and studies that show that farmers that use high tunnels have higher income. So essentially, like in the Chicago area where I live, um, if you have a hoop house, you can still be growing winter vegetables in December and sometimes as early as late February. So you really extend that growing season and extend your income by using these. We have a limited amount of funding. Um, we have a question. Sure. Um, and I, I hope I didn't let you go too far, but the question is from Cheryl. She wanted to know, is the grant used primarily in rural school districts? The farm to school grant program, no, uh, nope, it can be used anywhere. And the programs that are available only in rural areas, I will mention those. So thank you, that's a great question, appreciate that. So a lot of people think about USDA programs as operating primarily or, or only in rural areas. And we do have some programs like that, but there are lots of programs that are available anywhere in the country. So all of the ones that I've talked about so far are available anywhere from urban school districts, uh, small cities and the like, anywhere. These are fairly new programs as well. They were updated with the last farm bill and this is recognition and really when you think about um, maybe there aren't so many programs or things that uh, receive bipartisan support. This is one of those. So there's recognition that local food systems are a good thing. And these local and regional grants and opportunities through our LAMP program were created by Congress and updated. And there's more money provided by these. And we have some new programs that were provided with the last farm bill, the regional food system partnerships is one of those. The farmer's market and local food promotion programs had existed previously, but they're now a regular part and funded uh, through the, the regular farm bill process. And then the value added producer grant program, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, a few highlights. So USDA doesn't really define local or regional. Um, uh, well, we have this definition here, but a lot of communities define it differently and it kind of depends on where you are in the country. So if you live in an area like Southern California, you can get a lot of your food locally. Um, in Nevada, you might need to go a little further. So. Um, even though 
we've got, I've got that definition there. USDA doesn't really define it. Um, there are matching funds for these programs, these grant programs, and this is an annual grant program for farmer's market promotion program, local food, and the regional food system partnership. So that requires a 25% applicant match. Uh, and then the value added producer grant requires a one-to-one -one match, but the value added can be for businesses as well. So really unusual. And uh, I'll talk about that briefly in a few minutes. So and then um, because food safety has been a real focus, there's also this food safety element that, that's available as part of those. So who is eligible? Um, agricultural businesses or co-ops, producer networks or associations, CSA networks, food councils, local governments, nonprofit corporations, public benefit corporations, economic development corporations, regional farmers market authorities, tribal governments, commercial federal farm credit system lending institutions. So you can see it provides a lot of opportunity to a lot of different organizations to leverage these grants. So for local food promotion, uh, the funds have to be used to aggregate, to store, to distribute, and to process. And there are two funding tiers. Uh, planning grants, and then the implementation. And you can see the dollar amounts there. So they can be pretty substantial, particularly for the implementation. And then the farmer's market promotion program, it doesn't have to be uh, just for farmer's markets, despite the name. It's for any direct to consumer marketing efforts. And, and there are two funding tiers with this grant, the capacity building, and the community training and technical assistance. And there are as many examples of uh, grants here as there are states in the country. Well, a lot more than that. So a lot of really interesting projects. And for any of these grants, what I recommend that you do if you're thinking of applying one is go onto the USDA website and there's a page for each of these grants and you can find previously approved grant projects. And I recommend that you look at those to get an idea of the sorts of grants that have been approved in the past. The Regional Food System Partnerships Program, this was created out of the last Farm Bill. So it's a new grant program. And um, we just closed this one. And uh, so we'll be announcing these probably within the next three to six months. If you're interested in this program, take a look at the grantees when we announce those. Uh, but the idea behind it is to plan and develop local and regional food systems. So sort of if you're at the very beginning of uh, like local food systems hasn't really been on your radar and you're listening to this presentation and you think that you're interested and you've got different partners in your community, different um, organizations and government that are interested in this, this grant program might be for you. So now I'm gonna get into local food models. Uh, sorry, before I do that, I should mention one other new grant program and I, I miss putting the slide in, in here and it's uh, urban agriculture. Those were just announced the other day. This was also a new grant program out of the last farm bill. So this, the, this grant program uh, is designed to support urban agriculture projects. And there's one that's associated with that as well, that's for um, uh, food waste and composting. And uh, if you're interested in those grant programs, I'd re recommend that you look for that release or you can send me an email and I'd be happy to share that with you. Oh, Alan, I did have so, a question, but I think you just answered it. Um, someone wanted to know where um, they could find the USDAA grants. The, did they show you USDAA grants? Where can they the, find so I think you're, you're meaning the, the grant. So you can sign up. Well, first, you can look on our website. And as I mentioned, all of the grant programs have a separate page. So you could Google the name or you could search on our website for that. You can also sign up. You'll see on our website, I, I think at the bottom of the page, there's a way to sign up for notifications on these grants. The other thing that you can do, we uh, facilitate a network of 
businesses, institutions, individuals, and government staff that are interested in local food systems. It's called Good Greens. And we send out monthly email blasts from our office and they include all of the open USDA grants. So you can just send me an email, I'll get you the information. You can sign up for those. The other benefit of signing up for this is that we pull all of them together as well as any grants that we hear about from other federal agencies that might be related to food systems and from foundations and other organizations. Um, so just send me an email for that or look on our website. So Farm on Ogden, the first model that I'm gonna talk about is a, really a, a national model, uh, incredible place. If you're ever in Chicago, I highly recommend that you visit. So it's called the Farm on Ogden and it's operated by the Chicago Botanic Garden. And you might think a botanic garden, um, <laughs> what are they doing in farming? Well, there was an idea some years ago that the Botanic Garden, which is located north of the city, was really disconnected from the, a lot of people in Chicago. So they started these urban farms to introduce inner city youth and communities to uh, green spaces and then farming. And as I mentioned earlier with the Beginning Farmer Rancher Development Grant Program, um, they looked at this as a way to also provide opportunities for disadvantaged youth to get some job training and get their hands in the soil and learn some useful skills and also soft skills, not just how to farm. So a lot of the graduates of their programs over the years have gone into related areas of, and food. So they may not be farmers, but maybe they're working for um, a local food producer, or there are in many communities around the country, there are just a lot of new food companies doing interesting things. There are some indoor farms in Chicago and in a lot of cities. So some of them went and worked there. Um, there's a graduate of the program, um, one of their programs that operated in uh, the, one of the local prisons, they had a program that was available to uh, federal prisoners. And that person actually graduated from the program, um, was doing some rooftop farming at the McCormick Place Convention Center on the city south side, and then started working for a produce company. And uh, now I think currently maybe works for the international produce market in Chicago. So you can see he's not farming, but these were steps to the career that he's developed for himself. And there are lots of stories about that. So getting back to the farm on Ogden. So this is not the actual lot that they built the farm on Ogden on, uh, but it's representative of what that lot looked like. But um, <clears throat> there was this patch of land in a low income neighborhood, uh, high crime and Chicago Botanic Garden partnered with a local health care provider, Lawndale Christian Health, and they built this, a farm on Ogden. And uh, you can see the difference uh, between how these look. And they took an abandoned uh, building, which is right here uh, where you see the farm on Ogden sign. And, and then they built uh, these greenhouses and that's aquaponic tanks that you see up in the front there. And then they have beds. The original farm site is all the way on the left where you see those raised beds. And then all the way in the back, this is a processing center. So it serves sort of as a food hub because Chicago Botanic Garden operates these sites around the city. Uh, they have a number of them and because they didn't have any way to process the produce they had to immediately put them into coolers and then get them to either the food pantries or the restaurants or wherever they were distributing that food with this model now all of the produce from the farms around the city can all go here and if they're not able to distribute it they can process it and freeze it and uh, so this enables them to have more of a year-round food system which with the Midwest climate is essential. Uh, otherwise in the winter months, you're gonna be getting all of your food from somewhere else. And then on the right, under the farm on Ogden sign, the original building 
beautiful old building. They've got a community kitchen in there and they teach their classes there now. So I mentioned earlier that they've got these beginning farmer training programs. Uh, previously, those had occurred in other sites around the city and now they've got a place to conduct those. And then in the very front of the building is a store. So people from the community was a, a and it was a food desert community, they could come in and purchase some of those fruits and vegetables that are being growing, grown locally. And then Chicago Botanic Garden also added some other foods based on the preferences of the community. So while the original idea was only locally grown, they realized that in order to respond to the community that they needed to add some other foods. So there were requests for mango and pineapple. So they did add those. So their, their mission is to provide healthy food access, even though they're focused on local food systems. Here's another shot of the the greenhouses with the farm on the side. And the farm on Ogden is about many things. It's not just about one thing. It's about jobs training, urban farming, indoor food production, and particularly, as I mentioned, in the Midwest climate, this is key to having a year-round local food system. They have a farm stand there and a food aggregation, so serving as a food hub, as I mentioned, and then food as medicine, and I'll talk about that in a minute, and then the commercial and teaching kitchen. kitchen. So people that are interested in, say maybe they're not interested in farming, they realize going through the program, oh, what I'm interested in is becoming a chef, or I would like to make my own jams or processed foods. Uh, there's a way that they can get training and education on that. I was, I'm sorry, Shannon, um, or Alan, I'm sorry. Um, we do have a question from Lisa. She wants to know how was this perceived or embraced by the community? So Lawndale Christian Health uh, is, is an anchor institution. So they serve the community and it was Lawndale Christian Health that saw Chicago Botanic Gardens farm site that was to the left of the farm on Ogden and saw this vacant lot and it was um, a, really a leader there who saw the opportunity there. So it's been embraced by the community. And if you visit there, you can see that there are a lot of people from the community that shop there. And um, the other thing I'll say, and I'm gonna go back to this slide because I forgot to mention it. You know, in a lot of these communities, uh, the architecture isn't so open and welcoming. And you can see in the front here, this is all glass. The front windows of the farm on Ogden building and then the greenhouses, it's all glass and it's landscaped. And at night there are purple and I think maybe green lights. It's really impressive. It's a beacon in the neighborhood and it tells the neighborhood, you know, yeah, this neighborhood is worth beautiful things and the people in it are, uh, we're not having brick walls that are blocked off from the street and are, that are fortress-like. So the community embraced it. And part of that was also having Lawndale Christian Health an anchor in the community that was already embedded and part of the community that was a co-leader in this effort. So I would say, as I think many of you know that are in community development, um, swooping in from outside and just making a decision about what the community might might want or need and not having community engagement and involvement in the decision-making, it doesn't always yield the best results. Uh, the other model I wanted to talk about is on, mentioned on the lower left of this side, the food as medicine. And that was also part of Lawndale Christian Health and that leveraged the GusNet program that I mentioned earlier, previously known as Finney. What that did is the GusNet program, as I mentioned, provides incentives for fruit and vegetable purchases that are grown locally. So somebody on staff gets $25 that they spend at the farmer's market or spend on locally grown food and they get another $25. So what Lawndale Christian Health and Chicago Botanic Garden did is they took the produce that was grown in the farms around the city, they packaged them into a food box and then Lawndale Christian Health serving the community, 
they might see some, a doctor might see somebody and realize, oh, they've got some chronic health conditions that are related to diet. So they would give them a coupon for a food box and they would go and get this, well, they would have to be on SNAP. If they weren't on SNAP, they would refer them to, uh, to apply for SNAP. And once they got on SNAP, they would get this coupon to buy the food box. So the food box is taking the SNAP dollars that I mentioned earlier, which are federal dollars, as well as those GUSNIP dollars, more federal dollars and some local dollars, and using them to buy food that was grown locally. So that's helping to keep those federal dollars in the community. And then the other benefit is the health outcomes. So people that are on SNAP, the ones that are getting this prescription, it's called um, Veggie RX, and they get a food prescription. And these are very popular around the country when you realize that a lot of people have chronic diseases that are associated with their diets. So if we can get them introduced to food as well as how to prepare it, and that's part of this program, we can have better health outcomes as well as supporting economic development. Um, Alan, I have a, actually a question, a personal question. Um, I see this, is Ogden open to people contacting them? Because my thought is if I wanted something like that in my community, how, how can I reach out to them and maybe they can share their best practices so it can be duplicated in my community? You bet. Uh, on their website, you can find information on it and a contact and they do tours. Uh, right now with COVID, I, I can't recall how they're handling that, but um, there, there will be a day when we are post COVID when uh, large tours will be available again. But I believe they're still doing tours. They might just be more limited. You can always uh, send me an email and I'm happy to connect you with the staff over there. But I, there are two things that I'll say about the program. One is if you're interested in it, you really need to see it. It's really impressive. And when you talk to the staff that have gone through their beginning farmer rancher development program funded farmer training program and you talk to them, it makes it really real to talk to some of these people that are really excited about the program and they're introduced to a whole new world and they're excited about it. And then the other thing is because this is a giant project as you can see from the slides, um, it was a years long project. As I mentioned, it involved the community uh, fundraising, lots of different pieces that were involved. So if you're interested in, the, in this, I recommend that you visit and that you also talk to them. Um, one of the reasons that we facilitate that Good Greens Local Foods Network that I mentioned earlier is so that people can learn from each other. As we're interested in building these models, there's no reason to reinvent the wheel and make some of the same mistakes. So definitely recommend talking to them uh, before you go down this path. And. Uh, Chicago Botanic Garden also operates this Legends Farm. So what they've done over the years is, you know, they started with engaging and training youth, and then they added every year or two another piece to build a local food system. And the Legends Farm, and this was also through a USDA grant, Beginning Farmer Rancher, is they figured out, okay, we've got all these beginning farmers coming through the pipeline, and now they graduate from our programs. How are they gonna start farming? So this is a site, a five acre site on the south side of Chicago, and it provides small plots to beginning farmers that graduated from the program to actually start farms and farming so they can understand um, what it's like and get introduced to actually operating a small business. So there are some farmers there that have provided so really specialized vegetables for chefs at higher end restaurants in Chicago. And then there's one who grows flowers, you know, really incredible flowers. And she also provides these to restaurants and sells some of them through farmer's markets and other retail outlets. And then top box foods. Let me just do a time check here. Okay, got about 10 minutes. So top box foods is a model that provides a uh, food at cost in a food box in a uh, food desert neighborhood. So these could be for a SNAP uh, participants, but they can also just be for low income people that aren't eligible for SNAP, but are having a tough time 
purchasing uh, or finding affordable food, or maybe it's not available in, in their neighborhood. And it operated or operates primarily through churches. So you order and then once a month you get this food box. And um, this unique model is with Rush Hospital on the city's west side. And what they've done here, and that's Sheila Kennedy, the executive director, and you can find this video on the Rush Hospital website. And um, there are a, a fair amount of low wage workers in hospitals or healthcare settings, and they can also have a hard time aff affording healthy food. So what Top Box did in partnership with Rush is offer these food boxes to Rush employees, uh, doctors and, and more higher paid staff at the hospital they have to pay full price, but it's subsidized or provided for lower wage employees. And this also has the added health benefit for the hospital because if its workers are eating these healthier foods, they're gonna have fewer health problems and lower healthcare costs. So it's really a win for everybody involved and they're SNAP authorized as well. And Silas, I do have another question. Um, Someone wanted to know if the Ogden Farm project was in an opportunity zone and are there examples of collaboration for development within an opportunity zone? Um, not, I, I do not believe so. Uh, I don't know for certain, but I, I don't believe so. I think the way that this started was Chicago Botanic Garden had these sites that were available all, all around the city. So they were vacant land and then they, they built that site saw the opportunity there and maybe the city mentioned that this uh, plot was available and then Lawndale Christian Health saw it. I, I don't think it operated through uh, through any other program but that. Um, and here's another example. So in Corbin, Kentucky, so when you think about smaller towns or even neighborhoods of larger cities where you've got lots of vacant commercial properties. And um, so if you think about ways to, to leverage local food to fill those, whether it's a restaurant or it's um, somebody's uh, canning their own preserves, they can help to fill some of that vacant storefront. So uh, when you look at the statistic here in Corbin, you can look on their website to find out more about it. It helped to reduce the vacancy rate from 40% to 5%. And I'm gonna talk about a model a little later out of a farmer's market that did something similar. And Link Up Illinois, when I mentioned that SNAP customers, when you think about the opportunity is there to make sure that SNAP customers are aware of the opportunity to use their benefits at farmers markets and to also leverage the incentive program, the Gus SNP incentives that I mentioned. So Link Up Illinois is a statewide program. It's operated by the Experimental Station, a not-for-profit on the city's south side. And what they do is educate and help farmers markets to learn how to accept the benefits and process the benefits and market the benefits. And then also make sure that SNAP participants understand how this works and the opportunity there to, to um, maximize and actually double uh, to some extent their food dollars, their SNAP dollars by using them with this program. And then Experimental Station also operates a bike shop so they're doing training for disadvantaged youth on skills that youth can earn some money. And then they can also rehab bikes. They can get their own bike. Um, and then they can also rehab bikes and sell those and make some money. And uh, so Experimental Station is doing more than just focusing on building and supporting a local food system. They're really a community center and they operate a weekly farmer's market. Sorry, go ahead, Andrea. You have a question. Sorry about that. That's um, great. Beverly wants to know, can we discuss the funding support for projects that address food deserts? So um, I mentioned these. There are a lot, lot of these that could be leveraged. Um, so, so any of these, the local and regional, and this one in particular, Community Food Projects Competitive Grant Program. So you can see right here in the description, 
Uh, it's developed or existed since 1996, for, specifically as a program to fight food insecurity. So this is perfectly tailored for uh, communities that are dealing with food deserts or food insecurity. Um, let's see. And then these, the local, the LAMP program ones can also be leveraged for this and the farmer's market one, regional food system partnerships. And then the GUSNIP as well. Oh, Alan, I wanted to let you know, you don't have to rush. We do have um, an hour and a half allocated and we did that just so you could have enough time and to give okay. people a, a, an opportunity to ask questions. So don't feel rushed, you have time. Okay, okay, thanks. <laughs> All right, so another model is in Northwest Ohio out of Toledo and Prometica, uh, for those who haven't heard of it, it's a healthcare provider uh, network in that area in Southeast Michigan. And they figured out some years ago, so as part of their mission, they also spend some of their money on supporting the local community. And they thought, well, education is the thing that we need to focus on because if kids can't get a good education, um, they're not gonna succeed in society. And so they hired a company and they went in, consultants went in to work in the community and they found out that the kids, a lot of kids were hungry. So they couldn't learn if they were hungry. So that was the entry point for Prometica to realize, oh, there was hunger in their community. And from doing food rescue at the local casinos and providing that food to food pantries in the community, and soup kitchens. They've added multiple programs over the years. So the last, the latest iteration from a couple years ago is they had a local philanthropist who wanted to support their work and they took this building in Toledo and they rehabbed it. So they started off with a store. So it's a food desert neighborhood. They started off with a store on the lower level, and that store is SNAP and WIC authorized. So participants in those programs can go in there and use their benefits. And one of the great things that, well, many good things that Prometica does, they also realize the benefit in local foods. So uh, there's quite a few products in that store that are um, obtained locally. So wherever they can, they source it, whether it's hummus or vegetables from urban farms in the area. So that again, they realize that if we're going to address economic development, uh, we can look at food as a way to do that. And there's, there's um, no reason to only look at addressing food insecurity if you can address food insecurity and the root causes or social determinants of health at the very same time. And that's what they're doing here. And then they added a community center on the second floor a year or so after that. And that has a community kitchen and they do cooking classes there. And those cooking classes are provided by the, um, through our program called SNAP Ed and that operates through the state. So for cooking classes or nutrition education classes, if you're not already connected to the food and nutrition services, SNAP Ed, I recommend that you contact your state administering agency. So we provide a lot of resources and funding to states to do this nutrition ed training. Um, Alan, I have a question. It's a personal question again. Sure. Um, see all of these amazing projects and personally i'm like this is great but i feel overwhelmed now does do you guys provide technical assistance that can help people walk through this process i know we have an opportunity to contact these um businesses and organizations directly but what about usda do you guys provide technical assistance so there's we don't have a team that that works with a community there is a program that works out of EPA in partnership with USDA called Local Foods, Local Places. And actually Evansville is in the process of, of um, completing that. And that is a federal team from many agencies that come together to provide technical assistance to help the community focus on where the opportunities are and where the challenges are, what they'd like to address to help to build 
the project for the community to uh, pursue. It's, you can find information on that on the EPA website. It's called Local Foods, Local Places, and that's an annual program. There's no funding involved with it, but uh, as I mentioned, it involves a team that comes together. Well, and Andrea, you were, uh, I think, on some of those calls. So yeah. uh, it seems like it's been beneficial for the communities that went through it. So there, there is that program. Uh, you just apply for it. And uh, there's a growing number of communities that are interested in this that have been applying for it. So I encourage you to, to look at that. I can provide more information on it if anyone likes, just email me. Yeah, and I want to also add, like you were saying, Ellen, I have been a part of that process just as an observer, but it's been really beneficial. I mean, they take the information, break it down, and they actually, you know, just help you work through it. So I would suggest, you know, if someone is interested in making contact with someone with from Evansville who is going through that process, they should reach out to Silas Matcham. So I'll put his email address in the chat if you guys want to follow with him, and he can share, you know, how that process has worked for them, even though they're going through it now. It's still, you know, helpful just to talk to someone who's actually um, utilizing the service. So that's all. Thank you, Andrea. And I, I always recommend that. And I think most of us know this, that if you're going to start down a path, it, you'll save a lot of time and effort by talking to somebody who's already been through it. So, and, and again, that's one of the reasons why I share these models and why we facilitate this Good Greens network through our office is so that people can connect to projects, hear about them, and, um, and learn something about them before they embark on creating their own. There's a lot of interest, and I know in Evansville, in an incubator kitchen or community kitchen. So uh, this is probably one of the largest in the country on Chicago's west side. And this provides support. So all sorts of classes, whether it's developing your logo, um, how to market, and, and as well as some of the classes on how to, uh, how to process food. So this came out of, a, a, well, sort of a business incubator on the city's west side. And then they actually built this food and beverage incubator. So uh, for those of you who, who aren't in this food uh, area, but a lot of these new small food businesses that end up going national for food brands, um, several of these have come out of Chicago and this food incubator. So it's a great idea, a great way to support small businesses and some of them can become large national businesses or regional businesses. And then whenever possible, some of these incubators, these new businesses also source locally. So again, it helps keep those dollars in the neighborhood and in the community and helps with economic development. Farmers market. So everybody's heard of farmers markets, but uh, there's a lot of reasons to support them and there's a lot of opportunities there. So uh, people may not be aware that uh, for every dollar spent, well, I mentioned this earlier, about 15 cents stays in the area while locally owned enterprises like farms trap 30 to 45 cents. So where you've got farmers markets, you've got more money staying in the community. And there are some statistics here. I won't read all of these, but you can see that uh, there's been research to show what the economic benefits of farmers markets are. And they can also, uh, when they come into a community and they're coupled with other activities, so say music or craft show or um, some other events that bring people into the neighborhood, the farmer's market can help to transform the neighborhood, making it a destination. Another benefit of farmer's markets that um, a lot of people are not familiar with is that their spillover effect so there's been research on this that shows when somebody goes to a farmer's market, so say particularly in a community um, or a smaller town that might be suffering, so they, their retail businesses aren't getting uh, many customers or even the restaurants, so, or, or, or they are, but they wanna get more. A farmer's market located near that area uh, can help increase sales at those businesses and it really makes a lot of sense. And, if you visit a farmer's market, I do this when it's located near the commercial district. Oh, um, 
if there's not already a baker at the farmer's market, I'm gonna stop at the baker too. Um, oh, I need to run to the hardware store too. So doing all those things at the same time and it makes it really convenient, makes a lot of sense. I was on a part of the local foods, local places project team for a town, uh, Little Falls, Minnesota. And they were talking about building a pavilion for a farmer's market there. And they were talking about locating it outside of the small downtown and really recommended that they look at building it close to the commercial district for this very reason that if it's six blocks away from downtown, um, you're not likely to get the economic benefit that you would if you have it right adjacent to downtown where they also had some vacant land. So you can see some of these other studies here that shows what the benefit is. And for those of you that are working um, in your communities and trying to persuade community leaders to promote or support or allow a farmer's market, uh, these are the statistics that you can use and there are more of them out there uh, to help make that case. Um, so this is another good one in uh, Pennsylvania, the Easton farmer's market. Uh, you, you can see the Im impact there, an extra $26,000 each week. So in making sure that those farmers markets are all SNAP authorized in Illinois, it's called link. So that's what that means. So uh, we, the farmers market coalition and USDA from time to time uh, provide support for those machines. So you can contact me or look on our website. Everything is done virtually. We have a portal on our website for retailers, including farmers markets to apply to get SNAP authorized. So uh, there's a page just for farmers markets to apply to get SNAP authorized. Um, the Rockford, Illinois farmers market, uh, I'd also encourage you, particularly in climates um, <laughs> that are not warm year round, the longer you can extend the farmers market season, the more of those dollars you can keep in the community. So Rockford, Illinois, um, sort of a somewhat economically depressed city in Northwestern Illinois, uh, they have a thriving farmer's market. It's on Friday nights, they have restaurant stalls and then a lot of the local restaurants downtown would also get a lot of business and they have music there. It attracts huge crowds, you can see. Um, this is a smaller city, but it's really a social event. Um, it's more, you can see somebody's got a beer there. So it's uh, about more than just the local produce. Uh, maybe it's about local beer too, but they built this shed and this shed um, allows for them on a rainy day. You know, a lot of times I talk to farmers at farmer's markets and if it's a rainy summer, their business is down. But if you have a shed, uh, they're not gonna experience the reduced business because of rain or inclement weather. So highly encourage you to consider building a shed. And then the Rockford Farmer's Market also took, a, a, I think it was an auto dealership and they're creating a food incubator in that auto dealership. And that's right adjacent to this, uh, this shed. So you can see it from above, really impressive. And it, uh, it's a focal point in downtown. And of course, when the market's not going on, it can be used for other things too, uh, craft fairs, antique shows, um, that sort of thing. And then here's a model. Some of you might be from smaller communities or towns and you're thinking, well, what about me? Here's a model for you. Uh, this is a, a small town in Ohio in Newark, Ohio, and their major employer pulled up stakes and left town. And that was the focal point of their economy. And so they were left trying to figure out what to do. So they built a farmer's market shed and they connected it to the historic town square. And you can see uh, the image to the right, you can see the um, county seat or the, I can't remember if it's the county seat or the city hall, but. And then you can see the food shed and they took an alleyway and that alleyway is now lined with tables and it's actually, there are string lights above it. So it's actually, instead of a sort of a 
passageway that you might not want to go down. It's actually a pleasant space to spend time in and it connects the square with the farmer's market. And then uh, the other piece to this is they've got community buy-in and the I think the local hospital and the local bank also support this. So the way that the local bank does it, and this is when you think about really thinking holistically about food systems and how they can use be used to benefit the community. What the bank does is they buy tokens for the farmer's market, for redemption at the farmer's market. And instead of giving, you know, in the past, maybe the bank, um, would recognize employees by giving them a certificate to a restaurant or giving them a box of chocolates or, or something like that. Now they get tokens for the farmer's market. So that <laughs> helps keep those dollars in the community. It helps supports the downtown and makes the downtown more lively. So it's really helped make this an anchor for this community that was really suffering uh, when they lost this major employer. And you can see the, the visual on the left um, and that's pretty much what it looks like. It's a very lively scene. And then uh, they've got lots of local food producers too, not just the growers, but people who are canning and doing value added. Uh, if you already have a farmer's market and you don't do a holiday market, highly encourage this. There's one on the Minnesota Wisconsin border that's an annual event, attracts thousands of people. Um, and they're not only do people go there to buy their uh, sweet potatoes and cabbage for their Thanksgiving dinner, but they can also get Christmas gifts. So whether it's local honey or crafts or jams, these sorts of things. So um, think about that. If you're not already doing it, you can really make it into an event. And when you think about some of the successful ones, you're talking about a huge financial impact into the area and for those local producers and those small businesses. Here's another example in Grand Rapids of a food shed that really transformed a farmer's market. So this market institution in the neighborhood, they also have a little cafe and a little um, year round uh, building there. So over the years, so this started off like many farmers markets, it was just a vacant lot and they added the food shed and they added the building and it's now an anchor in this community. I, I visited it last summer. I visited it first, maybe six years ago. I really see the progress um, as I did when I visited Evansville, when people start focusing on local food systems and how they can play a critical role in economic development and being a pillar for the community, you can really see the benefits. And if you're in the area here, highly recommend that, that you visit. Uh, thousands of people visit this community market. This is in a neighborhood. This is not downtown Grand Rapids. It's, it's in a residential neighborhood. All right, so just to review a little bit what your community can do, opening downtown farmers markets, planning co-ops, creating centrally located community kitchens or food hubs, you figure if people are buying their food and it's coming from someplace else, you're missing out on keeping those dollars in the community. When you think about people buying jams that are from somewhere else or really any products, uh, the more of those that you can get locally produced, it supports those small businesses and those local producers, keeps that money in the community. And those people that have more money in the community are also gonna be spending more money in the community. So you can see what the economic impact can be. Starting and supporting business incubators to help entrepreneurs, small businesses. Um, I provided several examples of this, great opportunity here. Um, making it easier for people to walk or bicycle to farmers markets and local restaurants. Uh, the farm to school program that I mentioned, helping school children to grow their own food and making healthy local food accessible to families. And I should mention that uh, when we think about kids that either don't like to eat fruits or vegetables, haven't been introduced to them, if they grow them, there's research that shows they're more likely to eat them. 
developing community gardens and walkable transit accessible places. Uh, and I'll leave with this story. So when you think about, uh, to me, when somebody asked me before, what is it, what do you think in your experience, Alan, from working around the region with communities that are looking to change things and they want economic development or to turn the corner? Like what's the, what's the one thing that, the element that you have to have? And in my view, it's a experience, it's a couple people or a person who has a vision. And I'll use this example in Chicago. Um, this is the Reliance building, a historic building. And you can see that it doesn't look so good. It's one of the early skyscrapers. So Chicago was the birthplace of the skyscraper. Lots of historic buildings there. Lots of them have been torn down. City Hall and city leaders wanted to tear this down. It's not far from um, City Hall and it was an eyesore. And uh, there were a couple of visionaries that said, this is a historic building. This can be a destination and we should save it. So thankfully the visionaries went out and this is the Reliance building today. It's housed, it houses a boutique hotel which brings in lots of tourists right into the heart of downtown. There's a fabulous restaurant on the first floor and it's a historic landmark. So on the architectural tours that many people uh, use or, or um, participate in when they come to Chicago, this is often on those tours. And you can see for really a relatively small amount of money, I've uh, created a focal point in the city and uh, really changed how that looks. And this is an economic driver in this area of the city. So I'll open it up for questions. And please feel, go ahead and um, send your questions in the chat. I know a lot of you have been doing that um, throughout the presentation. Um, and again, I just wanted to thank Alan. And as you can see, I told you he was a walking USD encyclopedia. So he has a wealth of Thanks, information. Thanks, Andrea. <laughs> And um, I also wanted to note as we wait for, you know, people um, to send questions in the chat, I wanted to say we want to continue this conversation. And that's what the Promise Zone Coalition is about, bringing communities together. So we do have everyone's email address. Um, so we will follow up. We will continue this conversation as we, you know, plan for next year and just build upon that. So I want you guys to know that this is something that, you know, this is a long-term commitment, not just something that we're, you know, doing um, these two couple in these two weeks. I'm checking the chat as we. Yeah, and you've got my email address there yes, and my phone and number. I put that in the chat. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and then also, yeah, so, um, Alan has that on the screen as well. And I also wanted to note, um, some people were asking about the presentations. We will have this presentation in addition to all the presentations from all of the sessions. We'll be sending that out. And then you'll also have access to the link um, to watch Facebook um, recorded sessions. So. I want to yeah, and, uh, as I mentioned, there are constantly new models. So I try to do all the reading and connect so you don't have to unless you want to. So through the Good Greens Network and the work that I do, I'm constantly updating this presentation and finding out about new successful models or say what Farm on Ogden has added this year to their program. So it's ever changing. So please don't hesitate to contact me or to get connected to our Good Greens Network, which is a way to keep up to date on a monthly basis of where the grant opportunities are or the funding opportunities from federal agencies as well as private entities. Um, Alan, we do have a question from Michael. Um, can we discuss the food insecurity issue sooner? due to COVID-19 impacts? Um, so the food insecurities, uh, and I, I'm, maybe if you could put a little more information in the chat on uh, what exactly, wh what additional information you'd like. I'll give a little overview of, um, yes, food insecurity has risen with COVID. So what we're doing as an agency or department, number of things. You might've heard of the families 
uh, Farmers to Families Food Box Program. So um, just announced another billion dollars to be spent on that. And that's local food uh, companies that are sourcing food from farmers who, particularly farmers that have had uh, suffered business losses because they're no longer providing food to conventions or tourists coming into hotels and restaurants and cities, buying that food, boxing it and getting it out to food banks and other food distributors. So that, that's one piece of it. Um, and there, there'll be a big increase in that in the coming months. The other one is SNAP. So SNAP participation has gone up and anybody that's not already uh, encouraging people that have had uh, suffered uh, impact, adverse economic impact from COVID to apply for SNAP. All of our states have online application systems, so that can all be done online. We've provided flexibilities to states to operate that program. Um, and then if it's used in connection with GUSNIP that I mentioned earlier, then you can even increase the amount of federal dollars available to address food insecurity while uh, supporting economic development in the local community. And then our WIC program as well. And then for schools, if your school is not in session and kids are not getting their meals through the school, the school will be offering grab and go. Um, and we've provided flexibilities in that area as well so that families can go pick up, I think it's usually a week supply or you know, two or three days supply of meals that they can bring back with them. And then there is a food box program called Meals to You, um, operates mostly in rural areas where a food box of shelf stable foods is delivered right to your house. So for information on that, you can look on our website and there are a number of organizations that from around the country that are operating that now, but it was piloted by Baylor University and the Hunger Collaborative in Texas and rural areas. So um, I, if that didn't answer your question, if there's something more that I can share or talk about, please let me know. Yeah, Michael says, thank you. I do have another question. Um, let me go up a little bit. Does the USDA provide direct assistance to Indian reservations? You bet. Yes, um, through the food distribution program on Indian reservations. And we have staff in our office that work with the tribes. Um, and and there, were, there was additional funding, COVID related funding that was provided to the tribes. And um, so they're, they're all connected to our office, the ones, well, in, in our region, seven states in the Midwest region, we work with all of the tribes, federally recognized tribes. And it's similar, it's the same in all of our other regions. Okay. And then Michael, um, you had a question, can we convene nationally to collaborate on solutions? I wanna say, um, I kind of referenced that, um, just saying this is a long-term commitment. So um, we do have everyone's contact information. So we can look at that. We can come together. We can, you know, collaborate um, to identify solutions. So I just wanted to highlight that. Um, let me see. I have one question. Andrea, I can also, if you'd like, I can do sort of a summary email that includes a link to our uh, network. So people can look at those email blasts. If you decide that you want to sign up, you just click at the bottom of the email and I can provide links to some of the things that I've talked about, like Farm on Ogden and um, our, our USDA website. And uh, there was, oh, and I should mention too, so there are a lot of healthcare organizations that are interested in the intersection of food and health. And as I mentioned with ProMedica, even economic development. So similar to our local food network called Good Greens, we also have a network of those interested in these issues. It's a lot of hospitals and healthcare providers, but also food banks and food pantries. There are different grants that are available for um, organizations doing work in this area, and there's different stuff happening in that area. There is some overlap, uh, but that's a separate network that we facilitate. We send out monthly email blasts. And then we have a third network, farmer, Midwest Farmers Markets, that just talk about ways to support farmers markets and showcase model farmers markets. One of the last calls, they brainstormed and talked about the way that they were going to be operating during COVID. So lots of stuff happening with those three networks. And I, I can include 
links to all three of those blasts and you can sign up to receive those monthly blasts and participate in occasional webinars if that's of interest. Okay, yeah, and um, Alan, we can send that out to all the registrants because we do okay. have an email address, so we'll make sure we get the information out. Um, I wanted to get, uh, share with you our last two questions. Uh, the first one is, um, are there AG or food programs in metro cities in Georgia that you could recommend um, that participate in programs that you described? So, um, because that's not my region, I have limited information. I can connect you with my counterpart there, but I will say that Wholesome Wave, that's one of the national pioneers for working on uh, connecting local food or supporting local food systems and connecting local food producers uh, to address food insecurity and connecting them with communities that have uh, low food security. Uh, and Wholesome Wave Georgia is one of those. So they are a national grantee for the GusNIP program that I mentioned. So they would definitely be a good organization to start with. And then if you send me an email, I can connect you with my counterpart in our Atlanta office who may have some other ideas. Um, do we have another question for Michael? Um, is the USDA connected to HBCU programs historically? Yes. Yeah, so from time to time, we, we do work with them. And there are USDA programs uh, not necessarily food and nutrition ones that uh, operate through those colleges and universities. We might even have a web page on the USDA website. So this is one of those areas where um, uh, <laughs> I may have limited information based on, I, I work with the food and nutrition service programs, you know, primarily, but I don't always have information on all the other programs that operate through USDA. It's a huge department, 17 agencies and hundreds of different programs. So I'd be happy to look into it and to connect you with someone that might have more information on exactly what we do. I know we do work with them though. Okay. Um, and then our last um, question, um, and Michael talked about or asked this question earlier about opportunity zones, and you say you weren't really um, familiar or sure if that was um, one of the projects, but I guess another part to that question, do any of the grants offer uh, preference points? Yes. Yes, they do. Okay. And But again, like the opportunity zones, you weren't sure if one of the projects was in an opportunity zone. Do you know if those preference points include opportunity zones? I don't, and I would say that um, in my experience with this, most of them do, but not all. So when a grant is announced, that will be included in the grant announcement is, you know, like what they're looking for and what you get extra points for. So sometimes it might be that you've got a, you know, those that are working with four different partners, uh, different, um, different types of partners get extra points. Those working in an opportunity zone get extra points, but it, it varies by grant. And that Good Greens blast that I send that has the hyperlink to all of the grants that are open, you just click on that link and it'll have all the details there as well as the deadline. Okay. Um, Silas, I know it's 11.26. This has been amazing. I mean, we went the entire time and I've been watching the participants. I mean, everyone stayed on. So that just is a testament to the information um, that people were seeking, you know, regarding um, food and nutrition. So that's amazing. Um, so I just want to hand it over to you. Okay, thank you everyone for coming in. Uh, Mr. Shannon, thank you for the wonderful presentation today. Andrea, thank you for moderating this session. We're happy that uh, we was able to put this together for all of the uh, partnering promise zones. So uh, we hope that we can, again, uh, get some additional information through email, share that across the board to all the participants, be on the lookout for that. Again, I wanna thank everybody for participating today and we look forward to uh, connecting along the way. We still have a few more presentations going on in the federal convening. Please find your way to those as you see fit. Again, thank you all and we hope to see you soon. This will be the conclusion of this presentation. Thanks, everyone. Stay well.